Professor Catherine Russo, who is an Associate Professor in Linguistics and English Translation at the University of Naples, L'Orientale, uh, where she is the Rector's Delegate for Orientation, Tutoring and Disability. Her research interests are related to post-colonial varieties of English, intercultural communication, audiovisual translation and critical discourse regarding the discourse of migration and climate change. Her most recent publications have focused on climate-induced migration, populist discourse and hate speech against mi migrants and people with disabilities during the pandemic crisis. Now in Spanish, la profesora Catherine Russo es profesora titular de lingüística y traducción inglesa en la Universidad de Nápoles L'Orientale, donde es la delegada del rector para orientación, tutorización y discapacidad. Sus intereses investigadores están relacionados con las variedades postcoloniales del inglés, la comunicación intercultural, la traducción audiovisual y el discurso crítico en relación con el discurso de la migración y el cambio climático. Sus publicaciones más recientes se han centrado en la migración inducida por el clima, el discurso populista y el discurso de odio contra migrantes y las personas con discapacidad durante la crisis pandémica. Today, the uh, FOAM uh, project webinar uh, um, is entitled Hate Speech and Freedom of Movement, a Corpus-Based Critical Social, Me Social Media Discourse Analysis. And uh, after Catherine's uh, um, intervention, we can have some minutes for questions. Anyway, if you want to write down any question in the chat, they will be welcomed and they will be uh, asked at the end of the session. So Catherine, thank you very much for being here and you've got the floor. Thank you so much, um, Pilar, um, and good afternoon to all FOMAs, that is believers in FOM, uh, and all those involved, uh, thank you to all those involved in the FOM at Play project and for invite, inviting me to give this uh, webinar and uh, for their uh, in inspiration. Uh, thank you to all those who are attending out of interest, and I'm looking forward to your questions uh, later. Okay, so um, I would like to start this uh, webinar by quoting Anna Harent on negative solidarities in times of crisis. In her work, Anna Arendt looked at expressions of solidarity in times of existential concern for human finitude uh, as a result of crisis of great proportions. She suggested that in times of crisis, we are bound together not by familiarity and sameness, but rather by shared vulnerability. So um, we should find help within this vulnerability by remaining open to the difference and otherness that is always at stake in communal life. She reminds us of the urgency of such a notion of solidarity today in responding to crises such as the recent pandemic. Yet I would like to suggest uh, by revisiting her work, I uh, would like uh, that was of, of course about, as you might recall, the Holocaust, I would like to revisit it by suggesting that negative solidarity um, uh, could be, um, you know, framed as hate speech or social and social division in times of crisis, but also solidarity born in the face of a negative event, so a crisis. The pandemic crisis mostly entailed the first type, so hate speech and social division, uh, but in some cases it also involved uh, the latter. So my work tries to look at, you know, ways in which we can actually obviously increase and foster, um, you know, the, the latter. My previous work um, has concerned so hate speech and xenophobia during the pandemic period and more specifically, Sinophobia, uh, hate speech, and the Zabalism during the pandemic period with uh, Arianna Grasso, and negative solidarities and the Australian Black Summer more recently, uh, so um, climate change crisis. I've also um, been working on this because I'm involved in two projects, um, one based at University of Naples, Lorientale, called Negative Solidarities, the Age of Anger and Hate Speech in the Global Public, and also a, a print project, so funded nationally, 
uh, on hate speech and solidarity and the ways in which we can enhance solidarity, which involves three Italian universities, so L'Orientale, Messina and Bambitelli. But today, um, for, I'm inspired by our work in uh, our format play project on uh, on freedom of movement in the in the EU, and um, so recent work has um, stressed that COVID nineteen was not only a health uh, crisis but also a political and social crisis. Uh, I would like, and, and many scholars have also suggested that it was perhaps a communication crisis, which often amounted to a so-called uh, epidemic of signification or a panic pandemic. So uh, I would like to argue today that it is important to revisit how the crisis was communicated and how its communication affected the interpretation of events and everyday social relations. Uh, indeed, the implementation of urgent policy measures, um, in a, often in very swift, uh, you know, um, manners, often involved rhetorical strategies based on negative affects, such as fear and anxiety appeals. The latter uh, are, are not, you know, um, to be related only to the pandemic. They are a well-known characteristic of crisis communication. Uh, and they of and also of health crisis, and they um, are often defined as a good means to a good end in the management management of health crisis. Yet fear and anxiety appeals uh, during the pandemic fueled uh, the verbal expression of uh, hate maladaptive responses such as hate speech, which was based on the verbal expression of in-group idealization uh, and the activation of in-group uh, solidarity networks. And on the other side, um, negative other representation, blaming, scapegoating, attacking the moral character of individuals or out groups. And in our case, I'm thinking obviously of mobile subjects and uh, migrant uh, communities. So during the pandemic, um, we we saw a lot of hate speech against mobile subjects and communities fiercely expressed from a protected and sometimes anonymous position in social media. Uh, so I'm looking at Twitter, which today is called X, but at the time was called uh, Twitter. And um, so xenophobic and racist hate, racist hate speech uh, seeped into uh, everyday and uh, online and offline conversation. Uh, and I would like to argue that it, it could be connected to the way that risk was, was communicated in, uh, in news. Um, so, uh, but these I have not so far been uh, connected a lot. Uh, I would like to suggest that, that it is possible to conceptualize hate speech as a predictable maladaptive reaction to linguistic and discursive discrimination and inequality in the communication of risk in crisis contexts. So this webinar, um, as I said, uh, was was inspired by my participation in the format play project. And so today I revisit my previous work on hate speech during the COVID-19 pandemic by looking at some examples uh, from a section of you know, the corpus in relation to uh, responses to news-based risk communication uh, by uh, Twitterers uh, based in the United Kingdom during the period uh, first, from the 1st of March to the 30th of March, 2020. So in order to investigate the affect and discrimination nexus, I, I draw, which lies at the basis of racist and xenophobic hate speech, I draw on corpus-based uh, critical discourse and appraisal linguistics uh, and their application to uh, social uh, news discourse and social media. So the analysis is narrowed from bulk data retrieval to identify lexical grammatical resources to express attitude oriented to affect. And I associated, um, as we you will see 
um, I found that these were often related to the representation of social actors from a critical discourse point of view. So I draw, draw on, you know, um, well-known work on the representation of social actors uh, in, in news discourse. Um, so this is the outline of, of the webinar. So I, I will, you know, be, uh, you know, speaking about the context, the theoretical and methodological approach, the data, the method, findings, discussion, and some conclusions. Um, so let's go to the context of freedom of movement. Freedom of movement is a human rights concept, as you know, uh, encompassing the right of individuals to travel from place to place within the territory of a country and to leave the country and return to it. Such a right is provided in the constitutions of numerous states and in documents that reflect norms of international law. So here I quote the Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which asserts that everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state, and everyone has the right to leave any country, including his, his and, and this is also interesting, the use of his uh, own and to return to his country. So freedom of movement is restricted in a, in a variety of ways, but so it's a universal right, but it is restricted in a variety of ways by various governments and may even vary within the territory of a single country. Such restrictions are generally based on health order or safety justifications and postulate that the right to these conditions preempts the notion of freedom of movement. Uh, also, um, they may be restricted according to circumstances like wars and health crisis. So um, the situation is a bit different in the, uh, the EU, uh, which has invested in distinctive political strategies and policies which set its political agenda as different from other intergovernmental institutions. And Krizanowski has, uh, has actually stated that this is part of, you know, um, also the you know, having a stance and, you know, an identity. Um, so FOM in the EU was first established with the aim of fostering economic and political integration among its member states. It can be traced back to the 1957 Treaty of Rome, which laid the foundation for the European Economic Community. And um, so, this guaranteed uh, you know, freedom of movement for workers uh, and enabled EU citizens to seek employment, reside and receive social benefits in other member states. Uh, it further uh, gained prominence with the establishment of the Schengen Agreement in 1985, which removed internal border controls among participant states and subsequent treaties such as the Maastricht Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty solidified the concept extending its scope to encompass the movement of movement of labor services and capital and um, so with the latter the right to move and reside freely within the territory of the member states became legally binding as it was included in the rights inscribed and protected by the charter of fundamental rights of the eu nevertheless um Recent studies have on FOM have claimed that FOM is not an absolute right, but rather one subject to conditions defined in primary and secondary EU legislation. And as Bruce and uh, Westerbeen have recently argued, uh, while in the 2000s uh, it was viewed almost as an absolute right of the EU citizens, it started to be framed in terms of the conditions underlying the exercise of this right during the 2010s. So as an illustration, uh, as an example, an EU national from one member state can establish residence in another member state under specific condition, uh, such as being employed, having family ties, pursuing education, or having sufficient financial means along with comprehensive health coverage. And the privilege of residency might be withdrawn if the EU migrant um, becomes an excessive burden on the host member state's social assistance system or poses a threat to public security and public health. 
so um, conditional and or restrictionist arguments about form have always existed, yet they have increased in recent political discourse through renationalizing tendency in populist discourse and rebordering practices. Uh, so the most blatant example of rebordering uh, being Brexit um, and its use of anti-immigration sentiment to fuel public opinion in a presidented ways, Brexit reshaped transnational infrastructures, movements and networks that have been fundamental to the post-Cold War uh, shaping of the European community. It disrupted the larger scale infrastructures that supported the EU transnational community. And for different reasons, COVID-19 um, was another reporting practice that it, and it underscored the continued significance of nation states in shaping the structure of uh, EU society. The management of COVID-19 uh, was characterized by an increase in bordering practices such as travel restrictions and border closures, disruption of transnational mobility infrastructures, uh, and so on. Resource competition with unprecedented challenges ex exacerbated global disparities and gave rise to new sources of international tension and conflict. Conversely, uh, maybe somebody has their microphone. Okay. Conversely, the borders of the EU were uh, recently exceptionally extended as the Temporary Protection Directive was adopted for the first time by the European Council in response to the unprecedented Russian invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February 2022 to offer quick and effective assistance to people fleeing the war in Ukraine. These uh, uh, events are an exemplification of bordering practices and the arbitrariness of exclusion and inclusion these entail. Um, as Ruth Waddock famously put it, um, inclusion, exclusion of groups, people, nation states, migrant groups, changes due to different criteria of how insiders and outsiders are defined in each instance. Um, in this way, uh, various topologies or group memberships are constructed, which sometimes include a certain group and sometimes do not, depending on social, political and situational context and interactions. Uh, with this context in mind, my research draws upon theories and methodologies of corpus-assisted critical discourse analysis and appraisal, combining qualitative methodologies and um, quantitative methodologies triangulated between data sets and drawing on different theoretical approaches, such as the ones you see here. Um, and uh, so, of course, uh, critical discourse studies, appraisal linguistics, social media discourse, and, and so on. As I said before, um, the aim of, of this investigation is to test whether persuasive strategies of risk communication in online news media discourse contributed to the spreading of hate speech towards specific social actors during the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, news-based risk communication uh, has the important function of informing the public. And Fiskov and Katvani know that one test of a society may be how it ensures that its weakest members receive needed information on risk. During, so during the on, pa pandemic, news media intensified their role as a channel for the communication of risk in an attempt to bridge the gap between expert and lay uh, readers, but it mostly then uh, changed its function and focused on persuasion uh, and persuading the lay public to adopt certain behaviors and avoid risks. So the goal was social mobilization, uh, often, so this all often involved us, you know, social mobilization against a common enemy. Uh, and so warm metaphorization, as we will see later. It often involved also the strategic use of affect and more specifically of uh, fear appeals. On the one hand, social media platforms such as Twitter provided an ideal and 
window into how people evaluated uh, news-based risk communication and how they grappled with uncertainties about facts, options, beliefs, and common values during epidemic crisis. Uh, so uh, if we, we can draw on, for instance, Duff Pavinia's corpus-based social media appraisal uh, work uh, in which she focuses on interpersonal functions uh, associated with the expression of st attitudinal stance and increased emotive denotative power, uh, the introduction of management of voices uh, to whom these values are attributed through categories of engagement, and mainly affect as a pervasive attitude in, of microblogging. Um, as Zappavinia notes, in microblogging, it is not uncommon for users to devote an entire post um, to de detailing their current emotional state. Uh, affect is also related uh, can, is also related to um, ideational content and uh, content. Sorry, and um, so you can associate um, affect to um, certain nodes, and in our case, um, uh, risk. And people often share values and form ambient communities um, related to these um, to this to ideation. So, and we can see also that in the in the use of hashtags. So the appraisal approach is particularly useful for this study, as the massive amount of data emanating from Twitter is informative of users' emotions towards a particular target or topic. Um, as I said, I'm using Twitter because at the time it was called Twitter. More specifically, numerous previous studies have noted that social media networks cluster in terms of the emotions expressed by users. They have been defined as effective publics and effective networks. And Zappavinia, as I said, mostly defines it as ambient affiliations. In, in these hashtags, I used to coordinate and uh, accentuate values construed in Twitter posts. And people use hashtags as a resource to convoke communities of feeling around values realized as ideation attitude couplings. And participants do not necessarily interact directly in these um, and in ambient uh, affiliation. So the focus is on understanding how people are forging alignments and negotiating meaning through social tagging practices. From a critical point, uh, discourse point of, uh, of view, social media platforms such as Twitter may provide a terrain for the investigation of how lay people appraise news regarding migration, articulating their opinions according to deep-rooted presuppositions, cultural stereotypes, and ideological inferences ingrained in discourse. So this is the definition from the UNESCO of hate speech. And as you know, hate speech refers to expressions that incite harm, particularly discrimination, hostility, or violence towards a particular target uh, on the basis of the target's identification with a certain social or demographic group. So it may include speech that advocates, threatens, or encourages violent acts, and expressions that foster a climate of prejudice and intolerance on the assumption that such a climate may fuel targeted discrimination, hostility, and violence. So we have um, previous uh, studies, uh, but um, I, I've recently, you know, I think one study is very, very useful by Victoria Guillén Nieto, 2023, in which she looks at hate speech uh, from different points of views. But um, when she, uh, she focuses also on uh, CDS, and uh, she says that hate speech may be investigated through the following ideological structures. So polarization, pronouns, ideological square, activities, norms and values and interests. Uh, she also suggests that proposing a closed catalog of characteristic features describing a hate register may be impractical and fruitless since there may be a local um, generic forms of hate speech that cannot be, you know, detected or catalogued, and also that, uh, that we all obviously have also covered forms of hate speech. Um, 
so here is two mind corpus um, methods and procedure. Um, the corpus uh, was designed by selecting tweets uh, with the pre-returns COVID coronavirus plus risk during the period from 1st of March to the 30th of March 2020. The period was chosen uh, as it was, of course, then that the World uh, Health Organization declared the outbreak of the pandemic and they were collected through data with Python with the help of uh, Andrea Gomida and all duplicate tweets were removed. All files were UTF-8 encoded to avoid problems with special characters and in addition metadata regarding time, user ID, number of followers, links to micromedia, small scale multimedia and hyperlinks were collected. Um, and uh, sorry, so this is, I made a mistake. Uh, so this was the description of the corpus. So the first stage of the analysis involved a corpus-based examination of the Twitter uh, corpus, and it was carried out through ANTCONC, a, co the, the, a concordance uh, developed by Lawrence Anthony. And it first looked at keywords uh, analysis um, uh, in comparison with the reference corpus now by Mark Davis a corpus which is specifically compiled to represent a comprehensive picture of online news media outlets. Um, hashtags were also examined to draw information on ambient affiliation and subsequently the research, uh, the investigation focused on appraisal um, lexical grammatical features and uh, in correlation with uh, critical social uh, media discourse analysis. And more specifically, this final stage of the analysis focused on how users, uh, sorry, it's just um, reacted uh, to news-based risk communication regarding the epidemic uh, relate, uh, and representation of mobile subjects and communities. So here um, is, you know, the keywords um, uh, that came out uh, through a log likelihood test to ascertain the statistically significant use uh, of uh, lexical items in the corpus. Um, so these were considered, uh, I considered only lexical words because I wanted to consider aboutness rather than style uh, initially. So key lexical words indicate uh, that health risks and the spread of the virus were obviously salient topics in the corpus. Um, numerous occurrences point to the terms related to risk communication, risk prevention measures, which were discussed during the period uh, under consideration to avoid the spreading of contagion. Uh, also, the political debate um, 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 focused on, for instance, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson and then uh, we find uh, instead um, keywords that point to a strong reference to movement at two specific in-groups, uh, for instance, our, we, uh, UK people, and, um, and also personifications of UK indicated a strong preference for the representation of in-groups and out-groups rather than individuals or the expression of uh, personal identity. Uh, so while risk was uh, an unsurprising uh, keyword, as it was a query term, a threat was uh, also a key and related to the evaluation of unfolding events and reveals a strong use of war uh, metaphorization, which is consistent with other recent studies on uh, pandemic crisis, like I'm referring to, for instance, a volume recently published by Musolf and um, Ruth Breeze and, and others, which uh, is really, really helpful. Um, and also, uh, more uh, as already found in Zappavinia 2012, the social importance of information sharing influences the content of tweets, and therefore uh, we have this uh, marker identifying hyperlinks, so uh, HTTPS, was key um, and was also the most frequent um, in the corpus. And this confirms previous studies that the sharing of news or information is one of the most common motivations in the use of Twitter. 
so that is why uh, I then uh, focus on tweets with hyperlinks related to news discourse. So the next stage of the analysis considered the linguistic resources used to appraise news-based risk communication. And it considered choices for the expression of emotion encompassing both the search of behavior and disposition. You see them here. And it revealed that Twitter users resorted to all these major sets with a strong focus on emotions that are usually um, and unsurprisingly preferred you know, they were unsurprisingly negative. Um, and here um, we see that um, also that uh, some key um, important features were related to uh, peace and anxiety in relation to our environs, including the people sharing them with us, so to, to insecurity. Hence, uh, th these were the most represented set of feelings uh, in, in the corpus. Uh, so regarding concern, fear and anxiety. So I then um, proceeded to um, coupling these affects with collocates with a, um, a five, L, uh, five left and five right span. And uh, as you can see here, um, numerous uh, occurrences pointed to terms related to health related risks like pathogens and distancing, quarantine, isolation, spread. And uh, fear uh, instead further unveiled a strong preference for terms referring to movement and mobility and to specific in-groups like uh, UK and out-groups, we and so on, and out-groups such as Asian and Wuhan, indication of renationalizing tendencies during the pandemic is also given by terms such as front uh, and uh, front lines and um, which indicate, you know, um, a war against uh, perhaps uh, an, an enemy. So uh, on the other side, concern and anxiety refer to risks and threat, but respectively in regard to often to solidarity, like in friends and personal well-being. Uh, for, for anxiety, this is what we found. So me, mental health, uh, and so on. Uh, what about hashtags? Well, hashtags were identified in terms of frequency and keyness and largely confirmed their affiliative functions as facilitators of hate speech. Uh, so the, obviously not always, but uh, in, in many cases, uh, this was the case. Uh, for instance, the, the hashtag stay the fuck home or others like China lied and people died or Wuhan uh, virus and so on. Mm. And also uh, Corona apocalypse uh, and so on. So these, these, these gave way to, to hate speech. So finally, um, the search was narrowed to qualitative analysis to combine a corpus-assisted critical discourse analysis. And the analysis focused on the correlation between the tweets and the news sources, as I said before. Shortened links were, um, were very common, and so URLs were expanded, referring to obtain the actual domains. It found that fear appeals triggered negative appraisal and maladaptive responses, such as hate speech towards out groups, such as specific eth ethnic groups and migrants. The most evident maladaptive responses to fear appeals was the delegitimization of mobility and free movement. The legitimization manifested itself in hate speech, acts of negative other presentation, blaming and criticizing the moral character and behavior of migrants. Migrants were described as bearers of an adversarial uh, ideology and as a distant yet real threat to the in-group, usually indicated by the exits such as we. In numerous cases, hate speech was connected to the evaluation of social actors in the news source. So here is one example from The Guardian, March uh, 22, uh, in which um, we see uh, 
this nomination strategy, so uh, a million undocumented um, migrants. And uh, as uh, as you you know probably know if you've been working on the representation of migration and migrants and refugees in the news media discourse, numbers are utilized to give the impression of objective research and scientific credibility. Uh, but here, for instance, we don't have a reference to, to figures. Um, and also, migrants are defined as subjects at risk, um, yet their identification as a risk for the community is implicitly invoked um, in the use of negative calling uh, undocumented, the use of exaggerated aggregation, a million. And also, so quantification is also referred to uh, in uh, um, here when um, the, you know, the reporter states, nobody knows exactly how many of these migrants are currently in the UK. And the Home Office does not have comprehensive records of their whereabouts. Hence, uh, Twitter re um, re users responded with the widespread use of hate speech and positive and negative classes of concepts were built around participants. So uh, creating an overt opposition between the in-group uh, British people and the out-group migrants. So here you see clearly how uh, in red, how they responded to the nomination strategy. Uh, so, um, even commenting on this uh, undocumented no so one million in the first tweet uh yeah and um, if you sneak into a country legally you're not entitled to the same uh or for instance here again uh so they should if they came here illegally and another um tweet uh so don't you mean illegal so what's the difference between undocumented and illegal you misspelled illegal is undocumented guardians speak for illegal and in the last one we also see um actually uh, you know a kind of a fake new you know uh, you know saying that muslim illegals so a reference that they sh that they are muslim where you know there was no reference to this uh and that muslim countries should give them a home and they don't so just um total uh, speculation um and also a reference to um actually if you go back you see that there was a reference to asylum seekers who are fearful so they there is a reference to uh, their emotions uh, and here they responded to this as well so you know my heart bleeds for them not or you know tough shit and so on and um and also obviously um uh, mere um, stereotypical uh, prejudice, so crime rate and food rights and, and looting uh, and so on, and also, um, you know, an incitement to, to hate, you know, um, and to uh, violence. So some persons are getting guns. I guess they have thought of that already. Um, so in, in this other case as well, we have also from the Telegraph, uh, we have the nomination of illegal migrants with coronavirus inevitably entering um, the UK. Border officials warn people coming to the country legally that um, they are not being routinely tested or put in quarantine. Illegal migrants could carry coronavirus into the UK even when commercial flights are all but grounded because they are not being routinely tested or put into quarantine according to the union for border officials. So here as well, you, you find users um, that comment uh, mainly on the nomination strategy. So illegal migrants with coronavirus inevitably entering UK. This is mad and putting even more Brits in danger. Now more than ever, we must defend our borders. So, you know, a call for borders and also uh, in uh, the third tweet, uh, they're illegal, um, breaking the law and illegal migrants. Uh, so, uh, and a reference to the emotion, this kind of, in the last tweet, this kind of news makes me very anxious. Sorry. <laughs> and um, again, a reference to inevitably uh, entering UK. Uh, also in the Guardian, um, this other another example from the Guardian, vulnerable immigration uh, detainees. This is instead an example of reactions to another kind of nomination. 
so um, the reporter used the pre-modifier vulnerable to define immigration detainees and displayed a stronger tendency towards, uh, you know, um, let's say the choppers of the victimization uh, and to um, the discursive construction of a humanitarian stance. So here it states vulnerable immigration detainees at risk of dying if they contract COVID-19 are to be placed in solitary confinement for at least three months, um, et cetera. The detainees who have either committed no crime or completed a prison sentence for a crime already committed are facing the same shielding protocol as those serving a prison sentence with health conditions that put them at risk, the Guardian understands. So here uh, they responded um, by actually, um, you, know, to, you know, they expressed solidarity. Uh, and again, we have, you know, a focus on the nomination strategy, so vulnerable. And, uh, but they responded, uh, as I said, with solidarity. So our cruelty knows no bounds. This is in inhumane and degrading treatment of people. Um, also, we find here um, the last example is uh, from the UNHCR press release that uh, disrupts the definition of vulnerable, uh, of this vulnerable outgroup by using an inclusive we and points to the moral duty of human rights protection towards migrants who are at heightened risk. So by saying we are all vulnerable. Uh, here we have um, tweets that um, actually also respond to this. So we are all vulnerable and also, you know, call for action uh, through uh, MUST. Um, so um, to our conclusions, the webinar uh, specifically considered how UK Twitter users appraise news-based risk communication about COVID-19 during the first two weeks of March 2020. Uh, and uh, News reports had expressed Nina State's attitudes and feelings, which aim to engage readers in order to persuade them to adopt certain behaviors and avoid risk. And uh, they also actually use some specific ways of, you know, nominating uh, migrant communities and migrant individuals, uh, mostly migrant communities, as I said. So uh, Twitter users um, shared their opinions on news, this news-based risk communication, uh, aligning alongside or against specific groups of peoples. And this was based on, um, on, on the news, on the way the news had defined them. Um, and so quality analysis of hate news found that hate speech occurred in conjunction with specific strategies of representation. Uh, of these groups. So I would like to suggest that transnational local news media channel information on epidemics, yet they may increase the decrease fear and as a consequence generate hate or solidarity. Future research may spread awareness on the development of ethical protocols for risk communication in the management of epidemics, which may result in lower economic uh, and social costs for affected people. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, gosh. My <laughs> camera was switched. <laughs> you didn't tell me. <laughs> we, we didn't want to interrupt because we were much concentrated on your speech. So thank you very much, Catherine, for your um, presentation, which for me has been uh, quite interesting and uh, has made me uh, think a lot on what we are really facing. So we linguists should be... a. Uh, in charge of making everyone aware that sometimes we can uh, help a lot with the language or maybe hurt a lot with the language as well. Yeah. Okay, I've got one question. So when you when you started presenting your information and uh, and uh, and started to uh, to see how the media behaves uh, when they feel some kind of menace or or they are afraid of something and and they react in a way or or, or supporting or or being against groups, in this case, migrants or refugees or anyway. So I was wondering, and this is something that you have outlined in your conclusions, if, uh, is there any policy, any measures to avoid the use of hate speech in the media? 
well, social media have different ways of detecting hate speech, of course, but um, unfortunately, I mean, COVID speech or at that time, it cannot, as we saw, uh, detect all, all instances, especially uh, since hate speech um, is also based on uh, pragmatic aspects, local aspects, and so on and on. So it's sometimes it, it is not detected, in fact. Um, and also, um, as you were saying about news, well, of course, there are codes of conduct, but um, it, ideological um, inferences, are, uh, you know, are not, um, you know, of course, for instance, when the Guardian says undocumented or, you know, legal, and those people were commenting on that. I mean, of course, um, as we know, it's uh, ideology is what, you know, is invisible. It's the invisible structure uh, behind, um, you know, our values and our, you know, the way we position ourselves. So but our beliefs uh, and so on. And so it's, um, yeah, it's really, really difficult. But of course, yes this is what i'm calling for i'm calling for you know some some codes and and right. so on and just saying that of course uh you know um this even these um you know uh, weaker uh discrimination uh it, it's then met by all so we can see through social media how mm -hmm. these you know forms of uh, discrimination uh can you know how news discourse which you know, Van Dyck and, and many, and Wardak and many scholars have worked on, Charlotte Taylor have been working on, you know, news discourse and so on. So all these, you know, are then met and amplified in social media, which, um, you know, works mainly, uh, you know, to express one's opinion and one's feelings. So they are, you know, obviously they amplify everything. Uh, so. Yeah, I think we have Anna. Uh, we got we got one question in the chat, and I I uh, okay. I would appreciate Naya. Can you switch your microphone on, and you can just raise your question if you want, or shall I read it, Naya? Uh, okay, we got one question by Naya Curry in the chat. I'm gonna read it aloud for you. So we got. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for the presentation. Really interesting. I was wondering if you faced any challenges or had to make any tough decisions in merging these very methodological approaches and theoretical conceptual frameworks. So this is what Niall uh, mm -hmm. asks. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting. Thank you, Niall. Hi. Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, yes, I, I, I tend to try to uh, work from, you know, the corpus and, and seeing what's there and then try to, you know, make, uh, you know, to see if the first, uh, you know, empirical impressions are, are right through, um, you know, creating a method that may suit it. Um, so I don't know if that, that that's often very difficult. Um, in the in the methodological approaches, I think um, they they converge uh, a lot in many in many ways. Sometimes we use uh, different. Of course, the appraisal framework is you know um, very let's say it's a framework so it works in and also critical discourse studies that i mentioned uh, you know regarding discrimination race racism have their own principles behind them and so that that was a bit difficult yes sometimes but um yes that, they were both very helpful though and um yeah i hope i did a good job <laughs> thank you okay anna magibello also has a question Hello, hello everybody. I don't know if you can see me. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Catherine, for this uh, very interesting 
very detailed presentation. Um, I was just curious to, well, I wanted to share something because um, um, when you presented the um, qualitative analysis of uh, some of the um, uh, tweets with their comments, um, I, well, I, I got the impression that, but this is maybe predictable in a way, that um, there are more comments in response to tweets that trigger fear and hate compared to um, comments to tweets that um, uh, trigger solidarity or aim at triggering solidarity and empathy. Uh, and this is obvious because uh, this is a, a popular dynamics across social media, whatever negative that is, um, then people respo people's responses are um, um, tend to be um, where uh, people tend to comment more. You know, to, people tend to comment more when they feel they feel um, triggered uh, by um, sentiments of uh, hate and uh, concern um, rather than uh, when the tweets. Um, uh, are more positively oriented, let's say. So I was just wondering if you have some data in terms of number of comments um, in response to tweets that um, trigger hate and and fear. I don't know if you looked into this. Well, the procedure was different because mm -hmm. I went from tweets and then mm -hmm. I had, um, I, so I, I first investigated um, you know, the main affects and areas and so on. Mm -hmm. And then, as you saw, you know, I looked at the collocates that, mm -hmm. and, and then that that's where I started looking at movement, you know, uh, mobility and in groups, out groups and, and so on. And so after that, I realized that, you know, it was uh, often related to news-based risk communication. And so I expanded and I looked at the tweets. So I selected the tweets where there was, uh, you know, a sharing of uh, news, basically. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, you know, looking at that, um, you know, qualitatively. So, um, so your question was on whether the, we have more that are positive or negative yeah, but, so, yeah if you notice this trend if you have anything to say about it yes I, um, well um it was mainly negative but that's not that's not uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. you know COVID-19 it was a terrible time so it's a quite yeah I guess it's um to be expected but then uh if you I um, so uh, maybe I, I wasn't clear on this, but you know, I, I looked at risk, you know, and so mm -hmm. and so I, I then you know it was all about risk and, and COVID nineteen and so on and so forth. So um yeah, so yeah, they were mostly negative. You know, that was I, I can't tell you the percentage at the moment, but um, no, 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 it was just you know it was a general comment on the fact. No, 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 but and and also you you made me think about something which is interesting that uh you know all the as you saw in the examples um actually positive reactions were uh, far less yeah exactly yeah. exactly oh, yes yes you showed those tweets were um well those um um extracts from um um pieces yeah. of news taken from the i don't know what was that uh, about um uh, migrants being uh, or asylum seekers being in danger um, mm -hmm. and those seem to receive less comments um, compared to the pieces of news where um, sentiments of uh, hate in a way were 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 triggered in, uh, in, re in relation to risk yes yeah. was, yes mm -hmm. basically um, and also you know people tend to express their opinion when their emotion is very strong, yeah. um, otherwise they don't really use social media. That's what usually triggers. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, they usually. Yeah. No, that was a great question, actually. Um, 
Thank you, Anna, for your question. So what comes to my mind is that, uh, unfortunately or sadly, what we see on social media uh, resembles a lot, in a way, human nature. We tend to criticize more than congratulate and to pay attention to more to the negative things more than to the positive things. So, and there should be a change in our minds and behavior. And, mm. and we as linguists who are studying how we express everything using the language can make a, I think that we can make a very important contribution to try to change this way of, uh, yes. of behaving. Okay, good. So any other question regarding the, uh, the talk? Arianna Grasso, please. Hi. Yes. Hi, Catherine. So I, I was wondering, out of curiosity, uh, whether do you uh, notice any differences in the ways in which uh, outgroups were represented? Because I saw you had, for example, Hispanics in the keywords analysis, and you also had, like, of course, um, immigrants, asylum seekers. So I was wondering whether you uh, you saw any, yeah, any difference yes. in that. Yes, today I didn't really focus on this, but uh, I have focused on this in another in one of my articles um yes actually uh, i i found that uh, in in that article on sinophobia and so on um actually unfortunately the, there was a enormous you know as you know proportions of uh, discrimination against uh, chinese people and while italians for instance hispanics italians uh, I noticed that they were often described as heroes or, uh, you know, and this triggered, you know, very positive sentiment. I, I should also mention that a lot of, you know, people in NLP or, you know, are, are working on hate speech and, you know, um, sentiment, uh, you know, so sentiment analysis has been big, but um, I, what I like, wanted to do is to look at it from a more qualitative you know point of view you know so this was the aim but yes yes Arianna, yes there was a big difference unfortunately a big difference between the out groups yes thank you thank you so thank you so much and thank you Pilar <laughs> so if uh, there is no other uh, questions we can then um, finish here just as again Thanking Catherine Russo. Ah, oh, there's there are more questions here, or there this there are applauses, applauses, yes. yeah. <laughs> thank clapping, you. people clapping. Okay, thank you. so thank, thank you very much for your presentation, thank and you. we hope to meet everybody in our next uh, Freedom of Movement Project webinar that I guess that will be announced very soon. So thank you all, thank you Catherine for your presentation, and see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>